This is the sun. This is our sun, not the real sun, just a picture of the sun. Uh, it's just a small arc of the sun, but it is to scale with these models that you see here to the right of the planets of our solar system. And the planets are, you've seen here, you can see Mercury and Venus. The third planet from the sun is what, everybody? Q, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, which of course has been demoted, is no longer an official planet. Nevertheless, uh, this is our neighborhood. These are the planets to scale. And we're here live at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. I'm Bill Diamond, the CEO of the SETI Institute. And today, I'll show you where we're going. We are going here to Mars. And we're going to talk about a long 15-year mission to Mars, which just came to an end a couple of weeks ago. We're talking about the Mars Exploration Rover's spirit and opportunity. Actually, spirit was lost in 2010. Opportunity just was declared uh, on a mission ended um, on February 13th of this year after an extraordinary extension to what was supposed to be a 90-day lifespan for these rovers. Um, the first real science rover uh, experiments put on Mars. So we're going to be uh, talking about and honoring that mission. And what's really interesting about these missions, like other NASA missions, I mean, for many people, these are you know, not quite lifelong, but they are very often significant portions of uh, research scientists, uh, NASA engineers, and others' careers. When you're talking about a science mission that lasts for 15 years, you're talking about an extensive portion of somebody's professional life. So for the people working on the Mars Exploration Rovers, the termination of that program, of that mission, is certainly a big deal. And it's, it's like you know, losing a member of the family. So we're going to be talking today to our own Dr. Natalie Cabral, who is the head of the research uh, of the Carl Sagan Center for Research here at the SETI Institute, because she was intimately involved in the Mars Exploration Rover project from the very beginning, including trying to figure out where those um, rovers should go on Mars. So uh, let's sit down again with Nat. Most of you who have watched us regularly are familiar with Dr. Cabral. So hello, How are hello. You? <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, come on back, and let's let's go down memory lane here and talk about spirit and opportunity. So I think you're over there driving. I'm driving. I'm in the there. passenger seat. And you've got a, uh, a big round orange friend next to you <laughs> that uh, you might be able to, uh, to use as a point of reference to talk about some of the, well, the two places where spirit and opportunity went. But um, I, it was kind of fun because I was showing off our new scale model of the solar system, which of course is only to scale in size, not in distance. Those planets would be very far from each other, even in those tiny sizes, if we were to do this, uh, the distance scale. But uh, so there's that tiny Mars compared to the sun and, and even, you know, significantly smaller than Earth. But uh, this mission, the Mars exploration rovers were extraordinary. And uh, I think you had such a connection to that mission from the very beginning. Um, why don't you do some storytelling and tell the uh, folks out there in Facebook land a little bit about you know that history and how much a part of your scientific professional life those two uh, missions well, those two spacecraft of that one mission really were yeah it's interesting to uh, to think back because there was a connection even before I knew it mm -hmm. uh, I um, it goes back really to the end of May 1985 Oh, wow. When I went to the observatory of Medon for the very first time mm -hmm. and um, I had to talk with uh, people who would be becoming my advisors. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know anything about that that day. In fact, I was that close. And when I mean that close, that was 24 hours from signing on a master project uh, on a completely different subject mm -hmm. in environmental sciences in a different university. But uh, the first Viking mosaic map that I unfolded that day was of Mad in Valleys, at the end of which Gusev Crater was. We're talking about Mars now. This is a map of this. is one of the yeah. earliest maps of, of Oh, yeah. Mars. The, the Viking was the top, uh, you know, uh, of what we had at the mm -hmm. time, and uh, very far away from the resolution we have uh, these days. So um, from that day on, um, Mad in Valleys 
and Gustav Crater became part of my life every single day of my life. Uh, for a number of years, I worked on this, working on my master and then on my PhD thesis. And after the thesis, well, I was interested in the history of water on Mars. And at some point, after looking at channels, I, I became interested in understanding where that water was ponding. Mm -hmm. um, because interestingly enough, there was a lot of discussion about water flowing on Mars, but n nobody was really looking at where it was ponding and staying. Right. So that, that became that, and in 1990, my advisor sent me for a month in the United States at the lab of uh, uh, Jim Head at Brown University in Providence, mm -hmm. so that I could uh, do more mapping and get access to more imagery. Uh, we didn't have that much access at the time in France. So I stayed there, and that connected me with Russian colleagues uh, of, of Jim Brown, uh, of Jim Head, and um, the Russian at the time wanted to develop a rover program, mm -hmm. Mars 94 and 96. And uh, of course, Barzukov was the head of uh, uh, space science over there, wanted to land in Gusev crater. But mm -hmm. There were no studies. No, so just pause for a moment there and maybe explain why Gusev crater is so interesting and so important, why that has been such an important target for you know astrobiology and, and Mars habitability, etc. Well, Gusev was fascinating just looking at it morphology, morphologically. Can you show uh, everybody on the, oh, yeah. the globe uh, here so where Gusev Crater is? Uh, Gusev would be a thousand, so here is Gale Crater that you have here, and Gusev is a thousand kilometer. Uh, from Gale Crater. Yeah, from yeah. Gale Crater. So there it is. Right. About 15 degrees south latitude? Uh, it's about 15 south, yeah. yeah. yeah 16 south. And, and Gale, where Curiosity is, is mm -hmm. right here right now. Okay. So um, when you looked at Gusev and if you wanted to have something that you wanted to understand about habitability and changing conditions uh, on Mars, we're not talking about life yet. Right. But we're talking about understanding if conditions were good for life. Uh, could have been. Could have been, yes. yeah. yeah. So um, you had this huge channel about a thousand kilometer long, terminating, ending in a 170 kilometer, 110 miles wide uh, mm -hmm. impact crater. Yeah. And well, why impact crater? Because uh, uh, at the time, the topography with, the Vi with Viking was so poor, so bad. We had plus or minus one kilometer of precision. So when you're doing hydrology, this is really nothing. Yeah. And the only way of knowing that you really had a basin was to look at impact craters and say, yeah, you know, you have a valley, you have a crater, something on it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the Russians were interested. That got me a ticket to go to Moscow. Um, and, and I was very, very impressed at the time. Uh, I, I was 26, 26 year old uh, in the Academy of Science in Russia. Mm -hmm. and, and Barsugov standing looking exactly like Peter the Great. <laughs> um, dark, dark eyes and uh, very somber look. But he, he listened to that. And in the end, he seemed very happy with that. But the Russian program never uh, took off, literally. Mars 94, 96 never were launched. So I went back to France, and a few years later, um, the idea that Gusev was interesting started to grow. Uh, I was invited again to go back, but this time in Arizona, uh, Ron Greeley's uh, lab. Um, Jack Farmer and uh, Ragni Poundheim, uh, a student of hers, they were working uh, on mapping Gusev, which I had been doing, so mm -hmm. they invited me to, su to support uh, okay. that work. And uh, um, then I went back to France, and uh, things started to ramp up uh, a year later because I, I was working on legs on Mars, mm -hmm. and I had nine months left of grant money in my pocket, postdoc, and nowhere to go. The lab was closing. But then Chris McKay arrived at Meudon. He was doing this twice a year. And he was already at NASA Ames, I He guess. was already at NASA Ames, yeah. already your name uh, mm -hmm. in, in the community. And uh, uh, Chris has a, uh, had a concept of exobiology mission, but he had no place to go mm -hmm. for that mission. And I had to place, but I had nowhere to go, literally. Mm -hmm. And he said, why don't you take the money that you have and come at NASA Ames mm -hmm. and work a little bit on uh, defining traverses for a rover in Gusev Crater that would be interesting for an exobiology mission. Wow. So nine months later, uh, myself and my future husband, we took the one suitcase and we left mm -hmm. for California in, uh, at the end of October. That was Halloween night when we landed um, in San Francisco. We had one suitcase, and in that suitcase, there was a, a uh, 
pulled in the mosaic of uh, tit Viking images, mm -hmm. and that was Kisev crater. Yeah, yeah. This is what we left uh, France with. Yeah. So, uh, long story short, a number of things happened. Um, it's really about uh, getting involved, trying to get the idea across the community, and we, this was not obvious that uh, impact crater lakes were an important component mm -hmm. of uh, the history of potential astrobiology on Mars. Then there were a number of missions that, missions that were scheduled. Pathfinder was too small mm -hmm. for a large site like Yusef when you want to explore it, but I still went to those workshops and advocated for Yusef. And then there was a lender that was scheduled for 2001, mm -hmm. but, and I still went there with Edmund to advocate for Yusef, um, but um, NASA lost two missions, Mars, Mars Climate Orbiter yeah. and uh, Deep Space in 99. So that lander was canceled. Mars Odyssey was scheduled to recover some of the science that uh, was uh, planned for the climate orbiter. And then, of course, the Mars exploration rover were all of a sudden fast tracked. So uh -huh. you have to imagine that uh, 99. And this is two, this 99. Is 99 still. Okay. So 99, no, 99, NASA lo lo lost two missions. Right. They are fast tracking Mars orbiter. 2001, the orbiter is sent to recover some of the climate science that was needed mm -hmm. after the Mars Global Surveyor of 1997 because we wanted to understand Mars climate for habitability. And then between 2000 and 2003, there is the concept of the Mars Exploration Rover that is being put together. Mm -hmm. The rovers are being put together, mm -hmm. and the landing site selection is happening. Yeah. Everything happened that three -year for window. these two rovers mm -hmm. within two years. Yeah. And so when we learn about the Mars Exploration rovers, all of a sudden we say, okay, it's time now. By then I already had that you know, tag in my back. Uh, everybody was calling me Miss, Mrs. Goose, but I think that they finally give up and they say, okay, give her a landing site so we won't see her anymore. <laughs> um, but. Um, it was an I like that Natalie Gusev has a nice ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the thing is that uh, Gusev had many, many problems as a landing site, not the science of it, but uh, the engineering part of it. The landing ellipse for the Yemya mission for the Mars Exploration rover that were uh, uh, in, uh, known as M. Mayer, uh, um, the landing ellipse to start with was 180 kilometer so bigger than the in crater. diameter, <laughs> just slightly bigger. Yeah. But they say, okay, so we can reduce that. But the area that was really interesting for what we had in mind was the region just north of the what we thought was a delta of Madin Valley mm -hmm. into into the crater. But then, if you were putting that ellipse in, in that place, then you were abutting against another impact crater uh -huh. and the Columbia Hills and, and a lot of rough terrains. And so this landing ellipse, by the way, that Nellie's referring to is the, the sort of projected accuracy of how accurately can we place this spacecraft. And that, you were saying, was about 180 so the, miles. Or kilometers, kilometers. kilometers. Okay. So there was just... A lot of, lot of error, yeah, margin of yeah. error, yeah. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, so during uh, uh, all that time, I had Gale Crater, so this one where Curiosity is, was my backup mm -hmm. for, for QSEP. So we didn't do too bad mm -hmm. in that regard. <laughs> but uh, came the first workshop, and it was happening here at Ames, on mm -hmm. the other side of the highway here. Um, and there were 126 candidate landing sites, if I can remember. 126 candidates. Wow. That was the first round. Yeah. Uh, we already had, uh, Edmund and I, we had eight, I think it impact crater lakes, and Gale was primary, Gusev was secondary just mm -hmm. because of the ellipse. Gale yeah. fitted a little better, I think. Yeah. Um, so here we talk about it, and we talk about Gusev comment on to present. And um, I stood up there and I showed the science, and then the engineers come and say, well, you know, what would you think about taking that ellipse and taking it north? So, it, you know, it's flatter, it's safer and I think that's that day when I think back that probably was the biggest poker uh, um, you know uh, hand I, I I did that day because I said if you want to put it north let's forget about Gusev mm -hmm. 
let's forget about it because it's going to be lava. Too far, yeah. No, lava, mm -hmm. you know, and we land there and we're going to be studying lava plains forever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nothing interesting. And, and all of a sudden Steve Squire really jumped out of his seat like a, a devil out of the box and said, hold on a second, this ellipse is going to go down. Do you really think that this is so important to go there? I said, yeah, otherwise, you know, forget about Gusev. Mm -hmm. So that was the first round. Gusev survived. There were still about 30 or so uh, candidates. Come the second one, we went through more discussion. Comes the third one, which was the one prior to getting, you know, the candidate to headquarters. Mm -hmm. And the first morning was just very, very worrying for us because there were wind problems, roughness problems, etc. So I listened to that the whole morning and I was not too optimistic uh, in the afternoon. First round came and Gusev was third. So we okay. had two, two candidates. Mm -hmm. There were more discussions, etc. came the second round of, of, uh, of votes and all of a sudden Gusev was second. Um, so, you know, ultimately the uh, decision was made by the community as a whole. By then, between the second round and the third round, we had a uh, lobby in the, uh, around in the community, and we had a group. It was now a group effort mm -hmm. by the uh, Latinx community to support Youssef and Mary Diani. So this is what Steve Squires and Pete Feisinger, uh, who was the uh, uh, project manager mm -hmm. at JPL at the time, uh, they took those two sides and a backup because we still had concern. And the backup was somewhere uh, in the Elysium uh, region. Yeah. Uh, Elysium is somewhere around here. Elysium Planitia is here. So there was a backup in a, in a place that would be flatter. Yeah. So um, a number of things unfolded after that. In 2002, uh, I think that was February or March, then got a phone call from Steve Squire uh, telling me that I was selected as part of the MER science team. Wow, okay. I had been writing uh, a proposal mm -hmm. uh, for that. And, and two months later, uh, Gusev was selected. Fantastic. So, and, and then the NAI team here. But now that selected. was selected for which rover that was for? For both of them. For we both. Were, we okay. were selected for both of them. Okay. And, and the thing that was great with this mission was really that uh, you could staff any of the rovers you know, we had schedules, but you could go on one and, or the other. Yeah. They landed three weeks apart. Spirit was the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and on and opposite sides of the planet. And opposite side of the planet, mm -hmm. which meant that, you know, operationally, that was very interesting. This is also why we had two teams, because they were coming pretty much 12 hours apart right. in the science operations room. It's actually logistically yeah. convenient. <laughs> yes, except if you want to staff both of them, then you have to spend <laughs> a long time. And a few times we, we found that some of our colleagues sleeping under the tables. Uh, but you know, when we are, you are part of it, you know this is an experience of a lifetime. You, you don't want to miss anything. Right. So yeah, we landed with Spirit on January the 4th. 2003. 2004. 2004, right. Yeah, they took off in August. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the whole landing, uh, Launch was a different experience altogether. And if you know, for those of you who may remember, and those of you who may not, so both of these landers were encased in like a big balloon, right? Sort of a Airbags, trapezoidal, yeah. you know, so shaped show airbag. Some, some, some pictures. Of Why don't you uh, talk? Since we have this picture up, yeah. and maybe you can just cover what's what's in this. So picture what it shows, it's uh, uh, ultimately what you know what happened with the mission. And they were twin. They are to they are totally identical. Completely twins, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, my first view of, of Spirit on the high bay. The very first visit we had as a team, mm -hmm. we were invited at, at JPL for the first team meeting, and we were in a high bay, mm -hmm. and we were looking down, and uh, down below you could see two to my left. Uh, there were engineers working and tying knots around the heat shield, mm -hmm. and I was so impressed because they were in bunny suits, everything covered, inco including their hair, and uh, one was tying knots, and there was a second one watching what it was doing, and the third one. Wow. And then they were going very slowly, very methodically uh, around that. And I was so impressed by the care, sure. you know, that they were uh, putting into this. And there on the table uh, to the right, there was spirit of what was to become spirit. I think she was missing wheel. Definitely didn't have the band cam on yet. Wasn't, wasn't fully assembled yet. No, no, she was, she was still in the growing phases. Um, but uh, it, it dawned on me that the day that the next time I would see them would be 
on yes. Mars. Yes. <laughs> so um, give uh, everybody, if you can, just from the tabletop in your arms, a sense of how large uh, Spirit and Opportunity So is. Spirit would have been about and Opportunity. They were a twin, as big as a table. Maybe a little bit less, but mm -hmm. with the span of their, uh, 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 their solar panel, uh, twice that table, you know, just a, 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 a little cart. Uh, so uh, Spirit landed, uh, she was a, a problem child right away. Uh, she landed pretty much fine, except that uh, one of the issues in Yusef were really the winds, that we, they were mild because it's an impact crater, mm -hmm. you can expect because of the thin atmosphere of having a lot of thermal exchange during you know, in, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And so there were models of winds that were around 18 meter per second, and, and that was really marginal uh, to be acceptable. Yes, yeah. But they, en they ended up, you know, accepting that. So we are by our, our right on Mars, entry and descent were like perfect. And, and, and then descent, by the way, is this <laughs> airbag bouncing along the surface finally well, coming Well, that's the sand until the parachute up. jettison and yeah. then you're on your own, your airbags are inflated and you go kamikaze uh, to the surface and you go boy, boy, boy until you know there is no energy left and then you finally rest. Well, and then the cocoon uh, has to open up. Everything, so there were 200 uh, explosive bolt event that needed to happen on the clock for this mission to succeed. And we couldn't miss one. Yeah. The yeah. failure of one was the failure of the mission. So this, even before you get started, not to mention the years before, but even before you get started. So we are now bouncing, bouncing at the surface, and guess what? The wind that were recorded on the data uh, showed wind higher than 20 meters per second. Mm -hmm. So basically, when Spirit bounced the first time, she bounced higher than when she was jettisoned by the uh, parachute. By the parachute, wow, wow. And so she bounced back at the surface for five minutes. This is what the wow. accelerometer is showing. Because of the wind, it like kept moving? And the, 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 the energy, energy that, yeah, she wow. needed to get rid of that, to release that energy. So then she stops and, and sends a, well, I'm okay. I'm alive. <laughs> Hello. Hello, but then uh, something happened. The airbags, and I can go uh, 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 some of uh, uh, these things. So you see the airbags deflating right here. But before they are completely deflated, they had to deflate. And what you see, maybe on the other one, we see it better with opportunity here in Meridiani. You see that direct to earth uh, uh, antenna. So what's happening now, Spirit is right there. But she's communicating right away as soon as the antenna know, is functioning. Is functioning. Yeah. She's communicating, but then she's like that, the antenna, and we don't know it. Oh, she's the, not oriented. She's right. not yet yeah. oriented. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and what we don't know is that there is a rock or something right there. Mm -hmm. And now she's deflating. So the antenna is going like that. And for five minutes, she talks, and all of a sudden, she disappears oh. completely. Wow. She completely disappears. We don't hear from her for 15 minutes. Hmm. So and everybody in the room is looking at each other and saying, oh no, yeah. because we, we because knew. maybe game over already. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and there is nothing you can do. And so we are looking everywhere with all the antennas we have, and guess who is finding spirit, ultimately? The Stanford Radio Telescope. Really? That antenna. Right, like right. Oh, so the down, down the right down the road here in Palo Alto, Stanford has uh, Stanford University has a radio telescope. So what Nat's saying is that was the instrument that yeah. ultimately found the found the, the signal. signal. Okay. And 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 by that time, by fifteen minutes, I was thinking to myself, we didn't lose you now. And by by then, here she comes, and we are hearing. You know, the the room is silent, and all of a sudden we are hearing, we got her. We got her, mm -hmm. and every, everybody goes to the vision uh, So to go back to the first slide that we had that show, uh, actually I'm going the wrong way, um, we're showing, uh, showing these numbers. So hard landing for Spirit, we land in a very, I wouldn't say uninteresting. We mm -hmm. knew that we were going to land in, in a plane because this is what we wanted. Yep. But uh, it's very flat, and, and then we have to take a 
four days, five days to make sure the rover is okay on the platform where it was sitting, mm -hmm. and then cautiously drive off it. Drive off it. Oh, I didn't realize. So it stayed on that platform. on its platform of yes. its landing uh, here cocoon for five and days. Here, here, here yeah. she is, and this is uh, so she stayed there, and here is the ramp. Yeah. So she had several ways she could go out, depending right. if there was an obstacle mm -hmm. in one of them. So she took one of, one of the ramps. And so we went um, very, very, very cautiously. And then and she looked back and took a picture of her cocoon. And then she cocoon. looked back, and here it is. Yeah, so you can see in the bottom left of the screen, of the, the just the corner panel. of her solar panel. And she's looking back at this. And and so say, that's the surface of Mars. And, and that's this is, uh, just an extraordinary yes. image. It's absolutely extraordinary. And for us, at that point, I remember being in the guest uh, room with, with Edmund. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not the first panorama, but uh, at the time of the landing, because this image came back several days later, mm -hmm. at the time of the landing, we had a black and white panorama, uh, low resolution that came back, and we're sitting in the guest room with Edmund, and we're looking at Cusip from the ground for the first time after studying it for 18 years from orbit. <laughs> from orbit, yeah, amazing. Huh? It, was, it, it was a special moment. Mm -hmm. um, go ba going back quickly to, to the numbers, uh, so Spirit got some issues with software, I think I remember, uh, mm -hmm. within the next three weeks, by the time that Opportunity was coming in. So there were a number of things that, that happened at the time. Uh, opportunity landed in a very spectacular cycle, mm -hmm. and then they found the water right away. It would took Spirit uh, six months before starting to find evidence of long-term water mm -hmm. on Mars, whereas Opportunity landed on it. So the attention shifted very, very quickly to opportunity yeah. rather than spirit. But both of them achieved. So these yeah. are like the, the statistics. So for spirit, it operated for six years, whereas opportunity for 14, more than 14 years. Oh, pretty much 15. Oh, yeah, yeah, basically 15 yeah. years. 125,000 raw images from spirit versus 218,000 almost from opportunity. Uh, spirit traveled 4.8 miles while uh, Opportunity to travel 28 miles. They both went to a 30 degree slope, which is pretty steep, actually. Look and at that. Yeah, so they had to climb up that terrain. So this is and what we're talking about wheels that are only about. Yeah, they were that about. Big. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, one, one day we came in, or that might have been in the middle of the night, for all I know, because we were working with the Martian jet lag, which is pretty much an hour a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first image just shows up on our uh, screen is that. Wow. And it was just like, because we first saw that, so mm -hmm. okay, this is an outcrop, but what the heck is that? Is that behind, yeah. So what it is, is the flat plane we just left, and that you have to understand that the sky is here, which means that. So the horizon is actually this way, it's, it's because it's on an angle. Spirit was 30 degrees, and yeah. she was climbing the Columbia Hill. Wow, wow. So uh, going back to your statistics here, if you want to, to finish. Yeah, that. well, no, and uh, so I, I mean, I think it's extraordinary. But one thing I really want to highlight here was that while one was a six year mission and one was a 15 year mission, they were initially designed. I mean, the, the, the intent was that they probably go, what wasn't it, 90 days or something? 90 incredibly days? Short. 300 meters was mission success. Yeah, so and the idea was that the, the feeling was that they, they the solar panels wouldn't stay clean enough long enough for. For solar energy to keep them going. Yeah, that was the main concern, I guess, and then we didn't know exactly what we were going to encounter. That was a very big, first big rover yeah. uh, at the surface of Mars, and and uh, we were uh, we are knowledgeable about the uh, the amount of dust mm -hmm. that was happening yearly uh, over those sites, and we we thought that was what was going to actually, you know, set uh, 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 the schedule for for those rovers yeah. and say, you know, yeah. the deadline is here. On the other hand. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to show you a few things here that relate to, uh, to exactly that, uh, if I can find them. Here we go. So this is a view, and this is actually Spirit looking from the PanCam boom, uh, the, the PanCam is the uh, panospheric camera, mm -hmm. looking down, and we were taking this kind of weird panoramas mm -hmm. uh, uh, because we wanted to check on the cleanliness of the solar panel. So oh, so it's like a self-inspection. It's a self-inspection, and we're doing the uh, the underbelly uh, of the rover as well using the microscopic imager. Mm -hmm. uh, but here you can see that she's shiny, she's still on the plane, and you know this is the first six months of, of that. 
But after the first uh, spring, she was completely covered in dust, completely mm. covered in dust. And one morning, we were looking at you know the uh, the energy accumulated by the solar panel going down, 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 and basically we we had nothing left to to do. We couldn't drive or we couldn't. So that was the uh, uh, the first day. You can imagine uh, spirit completely that color. Yeah. The solar panel. Covered completely. in dust. Yeah. yeah. And and then the morning after, we have uh, one of our colleagues who was chairing uh, the science operation working group, mm -hmm. uh, saying something happened, and we don't understand what it is yet, but the energy is back to maximum, <laughs> where we're close to zero, mm -hmm. and we're looking at so of course the joke about Mar Marvin the Martian, you know, uh, standing up, to, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so we, we were joking about that, but we still had no. So you didn't, I mean, there wasn't an immediate realization that this was the wind. No, absolutely not, that. except that while she was doing what she could in terms of uh, operation, uh, Spirit had taken one picture, and this is not the picture, actually, uh, of that event, because I couldn't find it in the archive, but this is what happened. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Every single day, this is Gusev Crater Plain. So right? these are like the dust devils these that are you dust can devils. see on Earth. Uh, and yeah, on and farmland and in the desert and except you know. that they wouldn't have exactly the same morphology. Sure. Yeah. This is the morphology of a thin air. Yes. Uh, uh, does it's you one one hundredth the density of Earth atmosphere. So the air there is much, much thinner. But yeah. you still get wind and dust devils and and if you want to see the same, you go to the altiplano in the Andes. Yes. You're getting very high. When you go high up. The the morphology is the same. Yeah. So these dust devils, uh, they were coming starting spring. Um, into summer, and it was just like you know, uh, the, uh, the guards, uh, the Queen in England, they mm -hmm. were showing up from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Very reliable. Same schedule in the Altiplano. Interesting. Exactly the same, and you would see them just roam the plane. And we had fantastic pictures and movies uh, yeah, uh, yeah. of those. And so, what they did was to, well, you know, they, they were really helping the, uh, the mission and on both sides of the planet, both sides. So this is why we. Will so we have the dust devils to thank for the mission having the lifetime that they did. Uh, yeah, and 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 you know, uh, not to forget how skillful the engineering team was. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, they they got to climb uh, rover. Uh, Spirit was the first rover to ever climb anything on any planet. Yes, uh, amazing. So, um, but but then they did uh, some climbing as well on the other side with opportunity, 32 degrees slippage, rocky areas. Working spirit very very early on lost one wheel, not losing the wheel but losing the ability to. So what happened in fact was very. These are six wheel rovers. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we could we could lose an, a number of them, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what happened is that, it, and it was completely unexpected, that event turned out to be transformed by the spirit uh, by the rover itself mm -hmm. into um, a new instrument for the rover. So this is actually what helped one of the most important discoveries at Yusef Crater. And I'm gonna show that with this uh, image, if I have it here, let's see. Yes, we do have it here. So basically we're dragging a wheel behind us. She was not moving, so she was acting like, like a, a shovel almost, like yes. a trench digger. Uh -huh. And so we had no idea what was going on because it was on the back, except that one night we turned and we took a panorama and then we discovered that behind us. Wow, so that, what what looks like a little miniature canyon dug up, it's, that, it's because it's of a the trench. wheel. That's it's a trench that's from the, the wheel. wheel. We wow. were driving a wheel and when we turned around, we saw that the tracks of the rover beyond Spirit were were completely white. Unbelievable. It and is yellow. I mean, is this phosphorus or is this? Uh, uh, there is sulfur. There's uh, all sorts of salt, but this yeah. was salt. And the salt would discover that they were the beginning of us finding what was a hydrothermal complex mm -hmm. at Gusev Crater and wow. jesserites uh, and fumarole deposits. And it was completely serendipitous. So the rover brought a shovel. You just didn't know. It. Exactly. That was uh, <laughs> that, that. That was something. So we have a few questions I want to sure. get to. Um, before I get to those questions, may, could you describe uh, very briefly just an overview of the instrument suite that was on board the rovers? Uh, what kind of capabilities did they have on board for this habitability 
uh, yeah. assessment? So what we, we did have, obviously, we had the cameras for a number of reasons. The camera itself, this pan cam, had uh, filters. So we could use, uh, it was color, it had the same resolution as a, a human being, mm -hmm. 2020 human being, stereo. So we could already do a, a number of things with that. Um, and that was giving us some morphological uh, uh, um, ideas of what was going on, uh, texture of sediments. Mm -hmm. So Pancan was giving that. Uh, the filters were giving a little bit of the composition as well. Mm -hmm. But then we had mini tests. Mini tests was a thermal emission spectrometer. Uh, so it was an IR uh, uh, imager. Infrared uh, imager. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that, give, uh, that was giving us the mineralogy mm -hmm. uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the terrain. Then we had APXS was going, uh, uh, giving us composition. Uh, we had a mass baller to look in, in, into uh, uh, more of the structure uh, of the minerals that were, were there. And we had a rat, not a rat, although I actually <laughs> made a real job, rat. not a real rat. Uh, but we had a rock abrasion tool. Rock which means abrasion tool. The okay. rat. And as you can see, Mars is covered in dust. So before, we, from orbit, the only thing we could see was the composition of that dust. So Mars was looking very uniform except for a few outcrops. So we decided to have this rat and a brush, which means that before we get to any surface here, we'll be brushing No kidding. The surface. So a physical brushing it yes. off. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll be ratting, which mm -hmm. means that we could go a few centimeters into the rock, mm -hmm. and that was giving us a clean surface so we could finally understand what was the composition of what we were seeing. Okay. So, so almost like a little drill head, basically. It's uh, just, a, yeah, yeah, an abrasion tool, an abrasion or a grinder. Tool. Okay. Uh, uh, so this was, this was the suite of instruments that, mm -hmm. that we had uh, on board. And of course, we had some atmospheric uh, um, information that was obtained. Uh, we had uh, sensors that for temperature, etc. But PANCAM was used to do an atmospheric survey. Yeah. Uh, and also give us some information um, about uh, dust yeah. as it was coming in. And also we had all sorts of funny images. You see this one here, mm -hmm. looking like a little rodent skull. Yeah. Uh, they were, you know, and of course the conspiracy theorists, they, they, oh, yeah, they had a face ball, on Mars, yeah. Some of the skeletons. images we, we, we were seeing, f you know, on our screen for the first time, sure. we were looking at them and just laughing knowing, predicting what was going to happen. Some of them looked like skulls, some of them looked like, you know, what happened. Um, well, one, I, re like I remember one Tupperware on Mars. It was looking exactly like a Tupperware coming out, sticking out of the <laughs> sand. So we had a ball as well, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, well, you know, I mean, it's human nature, right? We can look at the yeah, clouds and well, we see yeah, a map of England yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah, people see all kinds of things that aren't really Or little bones that you can see that probably oh, yeah, going yeah. with a rotten head. Uh, must have been dinosaurs <laughs> on Mars, for sure. Uh, well, anyway, let's let's uh, pause here for a moment to uh, you know give some some hearts and thumbs up to Spirit and Opportunity. We bid farewell finally to Opportunity on February 13th when Thomas Erbuchen at NASA headquarters with uh, Jim Bridenstine standing beside him um, formally announced the termination of that mission after four, 15 nearly extraordinary years. So an unbelievable amount of science, imagery, data, and analysis. Uh, that of course you know was then followed on by by curiosity. Amazing because it would have never have been predicted that here you had curiosity and uh, uh, opportunity operating at the same time on yeah, the planet. That still, was even though they were not. very and, you different. Know, in addition to all the data, etc., what what we have to say is the number of people, scientists and engineers, that mission get to help becoming, you know, uh, coming starting to their age, careers, yeah. starting their yeah. career. Some of them are now, you know, well-known scientists and they sure. are uh, on curiosity and they took that experience with them. Yeah. Uh, the number of young people that were, you know, taken through the whole process. Well, this is what I was talking about at the very beginning as we were walking over here, is how, you know, these missions end up being, you know, a good portion of somebody's professional career. Oh, yeah. You know, it's extraordinary. Yeah. All right, lots of questions. So let's jump through uh, some of these quickly and don't forget um, to uh, let us know where you are as you're watching us today here in Mountain View because it's fun to find out how, how many different places on this planet people are. We've not yet had we're anybody. We're taking calls from other planets too. I was going to say, we're, we're, we're open. We haven't heard anybody anybody from Mars saying, you know, here I'm, I'm in the Valles Marineris, but uh, are there any plans to terraform Mars? Is that possible? This is a question from Nat. Yeah, yeah that's such a huge question and, and of course there are plans. Uh, there are 
different possibilities. People have been presenting several ideas. Uh, they go from the slow one, you know, bringing in some uh, uh, cyanobacteria to actually do what we did, uh, what happened on, yeah. on, on Earth. Uh, that will take a lot of time, obviously, uh, and you have to protect them from the very beginning because uh, it's a little harsher on Mars than it was even on Earth at the very beginning. So this is the slow process. Uh, the very fast one, uh, some people want to actually nuke the uh, uh, the poles, the poles of, right. uh, of Mars. Free but the water. Uh, just free the water, create an atmosphere. The only issue with that is that you still have to maintain that atmosphere because right. Mars didn't keep it's natural atmosphere. Yeah. So then there are plans now to, you know, uh, have a, a sustainable way to maintain a metosphere. I spoke with uh, Jim Green at NASA headquarters about that plan to try to um, mitigate the, 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 the resulting loss of magnetic field there to maintain an atmosphere. Yeah. You know, there's notions that, at least in theory, you could get atmospheric pressure up to a point where you could perhaps get along without a spacesuit. You'd still need yes. breathing apparatus, yeah. but you yeah. could, you know, potentially get the pressure would be to a point where you didn't need a pressurized suit. So, lot, you know, big ideas, bold ideas around terraforming. Really yeah. interesting question. Uh, when will we see mining th and 3D printing robots going to Mars or the Moon or asteroids? Uh, is a question from Pat. Yeah, mining is. Uh, uh, I think that there there are lots of talks, um, asteroids and. Uh, personally, I think that the moon might be the best candidate to be first, just because well, and we want to we want to test things, and we moon, want right? to test things uh, uh, out there. As far as three D printing uh, is going, I would say that it's going to be a mandatory thing to Absolutely. have on board. Uh, well, we're already doing three D printing on the space station, so that we yeah. started doing that yeah. a couple of years ago, I think, already. Yeah, so. I think it's very handy. Yeah. yeah. Um, are there alternative energy concepts apart from solar? and nuclear batteries to power robots and vehicles on Mars? Great question, that's from uh, Stefan. Well, um, Curiosity goes with an RTG, which is, uh, uh, it is nuclear power. That's nuclear power, yeah. 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 Uh, now, um, you know, uh, I think that if we have good cleaning solutions for the solar panels and not, not just lean on, uh, on the wind to help us, uh, solar panels, obviously, they succeed, right. uh, you know, 15 years of operation with no way of cleaning yourself the solar panel mm -hmm. is a great achievement. Uh, I, I think that for me, I would look for new ways of powering um, <laughs> spacecraft to go from one planet to the next once we are there, yeah. you know. Well, this is what, you know, uh, is a lot of the interest in uh, what we call space resources or mining on places like the moon or on Mars is to create fuel, uh, to generate fuel from hydrogen and oxygen that would allow you to fuel rockets to go further out to the yeah. next step. So that's a big part of what so-called space resources is all about. But it's still taking too long, so I think we, we, we have to have a revolution in, in We need uh, a power. In propulsion. Yeah. And to, I, t I think to answer the question is there isn't really a good alternative. I mean, and if you go for, far enough away from the sun, if you're a mission like New Horizons that went past Pluto and out to the Kuiper Belt, Solar energy isn't isn't going to do you any good. You're too far away from the sun, so that was also a nuclear powered craft. So we've got some some new technologies yet to invent to solve the power issue. I mean, nuclear we can say you know works. It lasts a long time, and uh, and and it's effective. But uh, but other things will probably need to be developed. Um, okay, it says here paraphrase from Italian. So <laughs> Not sure who did the paraphrasing, but is it possible that conditions for human settlement on some part of Mars are closer than we think? Uh, I don't. I guess what they mean in closer in time is it? Is it? Uh, uh, what What is the time horizon? Giovanni wants to know for for settlements, human settlements on Mars. You, you, I think we're talking at least twenty. I would say beyond yeah, you, you, you hear a number of things. Some say you know ten years from now. You have to be realistic about those things. Um, I. Beyond, being on Mars is going to be a, a challenge in the first place, but going to Mars right now, we still have to solve a number of very, very, uh, you know, important issues when it comes to the uh, uh, medical aspect of yes. space travel for long duration space travel. Right. They are not solved. And um, you don't want to have a crew arriving on Mars and being completely sick or being completely weak. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we need to solve a number of those things. And then there is the uh, realistic 
view of what it is to be on Mars. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the moon. You cannot go home and be back in three days. That's right. When you, you are there, you have a lot of contingency planning that goes. You are on your own. Yeah. You are on your own, and and you will never be able to just take a walk very easily. You know. Uh, Definitely want to bring potato seeds. I you guess. want to bring potato seeds, and <laughs> it's what I'm saying is that yes, it will happen. Mm -hmm. um, we have to be humble, and we have to be willing to be a stepping stone. You have to be patient. You can't rush it. Exactly. exactly. I think the other thing is, you know, you think of just the raw payload issue of delivering material there to build habitats. You're probably talking about pre-delivering things on, on unmanned missions yes. that deliver the hardware that allows then um, missions with, with uh, men and women on board to subsequently go and erect um, uh, housing you know, habitats, et cetera. So it's it's complex. I don't think it's around the corner, but no. the, you know, the problems and challenges the are being is, worked on and discussed now. Yeah, there, there are two visions, and the, the, the vision is, you know, planting the flag, yeah, great, planting the flag yeah. is good, but it's not the end. It's not the end. I mean, what it's we wa really want to do is the, the science. <laughs> yeah, well, but, but then, even if you want to live there, you, yeah. know, you better be prepared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, did the Mars rovers measure any quakes? Uh, I think Stefan is asking this again. I don't think they had seismometers on, no, on the rovers. No, they didn't. Uh, and, but that's a very good question mm -hmm. because this is why we sent InSight. Yeah, so InSight is a mission that landed just last year. When did InSight land? A few months ago. A few months ago, just before the it end of uh, last year. Yeah. This is a lander, not a rover. So the InSight mission has these two rounded, unfolded like butterfly wings in a way, but it, it has two large circular solar panels. It's a stationary. Um, lander. I think we talked about it in one of our Facebook lives, and it has a probe which will drill down deep to make thermal um, characteristic measurements down through the um, uh, surface of Mars. I think it's going, let's say, 30 feet or even yeah, 30 it's meters. A, I can't remember. It's the, uh, no, it's not 30 meters. But I think it's 30 feet. It's, and, it's, uh, it will be the deepest hole dug on, uh, on another planet. Deep. So we're developing yeah. that capability as well. Right now, the rovers, those two, they were just uh, uh, you know a few kind centimeters. Uh, Mars 2020 and ExoMars uh, could go between one and two meters, but InSight is going deeper than that. Yeah, and uh, the um, the InSight uh, uh, spacecraft or lander uh, does have a seismometer, so it has a separate thing that sits on the surface and is designed exactly to measure quakes, which are yeah. interesting to understand I'm the expecting geology. I expect we'll find some because there, there is sign of a young volcanism. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this one question because it's a good kind of wrap-up question uh, that Emilio is asking. Uh, with new computer and miniaturization, what types of rovers are possible today? Uh, Dwayne wants to know. Well, we've got Mars 2020 coming up, which is yeah, well, which a curiosity-like uh, rover. It, it's probably uh, a counterpoint to, to that because, uh, uh, well, uh, the, the Mars 2020 is a big flame. It's a small yeah. car. It's the size of an and, SUV. Yeah, right, right. and, and uh, same thing for ExoMars. Uh, you know what? Size, shape, uh, mode of propulsion, and payload, all that depend on what you want to do. Sure. What is the goal of your mission? Yeah. So it's not necessarily about smart. Uh, you might want to miniaturize things, and it is good because the more mass and the cost, you know, the more cost. The lighter the mass, the lower the cost. Yeah, yeah the lower. Sure. So, but you know, uh, the design depends on what you want to achieve. And I, I would say, you know, design vectors in, in instrumentation aren't necessarily the same as they are in semiconductors where you want to, you know, crowd more, more um, uh, transistors and gates into smaller and smaller sizes. Um, so it's really, you know, as Matt says, you want small, light instruments. You want to be able to pack more instruments on a given payload, on a given uh, device. So from that point of view, certainly uh, miniaturization is important. But at the end yeah, of the day, yeah. there are certain fundamental things that when you're talking about instruments and sensors, uh, to measure various parameters, you know, you, you have physical and, and AI, which uh, will allow us to do a lot more on board than yeah. we're doing right now in terms of analysis and in terms of taking charge of the, the robot, actually taking charge of the mission instead right. of waiting for the science team. So, it, it, you so know, autonomy. A, a lot more autonomy, yeah. which will mean more productive and efficient missions as well. Yeah, that that is actually one of the great ways to improve productivity is have autonomous missions. Uh, you mentioned the. Um, uh, in terms of AI, well, you mentioned in terms of habitability on Mars or human habitation on Mars, um, the whole issue of space medicine. And uh, so the Canadian Space Agency is working closely with NASA Ames on the space medicine problem. 
we're hoping uh, those of you who are regular followers, you know about our Frontier Development Lab program where we bring young scientists in, in machine learning and AI together with their counterparts in, in basic research areas. And one of the topics we're planning to get into this year is space medicine. What are the issues involved in uh, providing medical support on these long-term you know, missions where, as Matt pointed out, you can't like turn around and come back and get a Band-Aid. So uh, a lot of interesting technology there. Um, could astronauts generate wind power on Mars? Well, the question is whether there's enough wind to really move a mass sufficiently to generate power. Um, yeah, that, that goes to this movie where you see this huge storm the Martian. in the Martian <laughs> moving stuff around. Yeah. So there is a lot of wind on Mars, and it goes very fast, but it blows into nothing. Yeah, it's just not enough. Yeah, you know, dense material. So you know, if you if you watch the Martian, of course. Um, uh, there was a vehicle needed for the story to enable an astronaut getting, or to uh, provide for an astronaut getting left behind, and that was, you know, a windstorm that knocks things over. And, and as Nat points out, there really isn't enough density of the atmosphere, even though there are strong winds and fast winds, but there's not enough material density to move things to knock them over. And I'm not sure whether wind power would be uh, well, you know, possible. Having, yeah, having said that, um, we we uh, had a, a very interesting movie, and I don't have it here, and people can find it online. Uh, let's see if I can find it fast enough. So when we got close to this guy here, which is the heat shield uh, of uh, opportunity. That's from the spring. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're literally spring everywhere, so we're littering uh, uh, other plants. But there were pieces of fabric uh, that were showing here and there. You see it's pretty beat up. It yes. tells you how fast uh, and how hard uh, it but the piece of fabric, we made a little video, and you could see it moving. Oh, it's moving in, in the wind. wind. Oh, interesting. That's I, that's a cool. I'd like to see that one. Uh, okay, could rovers be designed with solar solar panels that can tilt vertically to ninety degrees to start working at sunrise, for example? Uh, there was one that was developed by the Carnegie Mellon uh, uh, Robotics Group. Yeah. Uh, that went uh, around the pole mm -hmm. and had exactly that. Mm -hmm. So the, it was not used. Uh, it hasn't been used yet. On a lander, uh, on a, or, or on a, a planet, yeah. but yeah, on a different planet than mm -hmm. ours. But uh, definitely, this yeah. this capability. Yeah, exists. that's a great idea. It was a good question from Kevin. Could rovers incorporate some sort of ultrasonic vibration technology on solar panels to remove dust? Ah, oh, that's an interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting. So yeah, sure. vibrate them. Sure. Uh, yeah, as long as you know what you're doing with the electronics around, yeah, and uh, yeah. you know, yeah. that's. Uh, I, I guess that all of this is going to make progress. We and this is another thing that those missions uh, have taught us. You know the lessons we learned and how we can improve. Yeah. Now, of course, Mars twenty twenty is again a nuclear power device. Yes. Right. So there's no no solar panels on that. But uh, great ideas. Uh, so you guys can send your applications into NASA. They're probably hiring still. Um, and with new computer power and miniatures, oh, we asked that one. Uh, is there enough atmospheric pressure to operate drones? Answer, yes. <laughs> well, and in fact, there are new drones now yeah. that don't require any pressure. They are developing drones to work pretty much in the vacuum of, uh, of space. And this is uh, uh, one of the reasons why uh, Mars 2020 is going to have a drone on board. Now, but my understanding is that the Mars 2020 drone, at least the prototypes I saw in, in Jim Green's office, uh, are conventional prototypes. Yeah. You know, longer, I guess, bigger blades. Because they have to, you know, have work to a lot harder with a, such yeah. a thin atmosphere. But yeah, they're they're on Mars 2020, which again is a Curiosity-like SUV-sized rover. Underneath will be a drone that they will deploy, and I guess come, you know, do imaging and, and other things. Come back and recharge. It's a fantastic and reconnaissance them. tool. We will Great use that in, uh, in the Atacama and the Arctic Plano. That's true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It gives you this integration between orbit to the ground that we don't have now. We are missing a lot of information that's so critical in terms of biosignatures. Yeah, you can't do the same kind of imaging from uh, an orbiting satellite. Yeah. So, that, yeah, drones are very important. Great question from uh, Stefan again. Could astronauts generate wind power on Mars? Okay, we talked about that one. And uh, so the one that I wanted to come back to, uh, because I think it's a, it's a good way to begin wrapping things up, is what are your expectations for Mars missions for the next decade? So we, we know, of course, Mars 2020 is going to go. I don't know if there's um, other landers or rovers after Mars 2020 that are no, in the pipeline. No, right now at this there point. there is something uh, that is still being uh, discussed: is the Mars sample return. Uh, 
So, oh, of course, which in uh, fact, March 2020 is supposed to leave behind yeah, canisters, caching, right? Yeah, caching samples. Caching materials so, and yeah. leaving behind little canisters that a subsequent mission is intended to go pick up yeah. to bring back to Earth to analyze. But uh, but that are, return a, mission isn't yeah, really defined. There, there is a lot of debate, uh, you know. So we know for a fact that we will have more um, capabilities here on Earth, more time to do things the right way. So uh, there is, of course, a tendency to say, let's go get those rocks. And this has a number of problems that you need to solve. You need to land close is not that much of a deal, but you still have to catch those things and go back. Right. So that's a, a, an issue. But if you want uh, to do that, then you have to accept the fact that regardless of all the precautions that you're taking, you don't know how your sample is going to evolve inside that canister. Inside the canister, sure. Yeah. And so that's a big question mark, and mm -hmm. we still have to figure this one out. Um, on the other hand, um, sending the right capabilities, uh, a small lab uh, on the Martian surface, where you have thin sectioning possible, where you have all the capabilities that you want to study samples at the surface of Mars, mm -hmm. uh, whether autonomously, once we have humans, there That's and different. it will be yeah it yeah. will be different yeah. Yeah. yeah great question so uh, and I guess it, it's fair to say that you know as these missions progress we're getting closer to having to be deploying the technologies that really have the ability to detect you know the presence of, of at least primitive biology yes and, and uh, right now a number of labs around the world are, are working on these DNA assays uh, where you can look for DNA and I always uh, see those comments, people saying, but what if life is not based on the same type of thing that, so, and that, that, that's a fair comment. Mm -hmm. uh, something completely different could have, you know, uh, developed on Mars, yeah, but yeah. there is something we know too, is that if life is something we know of, it's energy and information. Mm -hmm. And one of the thing that life wants to do is to transfer that information. So it might not it be has DNA. To have a mechanism. Exactly. Right, right. So it will be something that we at least can recognize as a conveyor of information. Mm -hmm. um, so um, people are working uh, on this kind of, uh, of capabilities. Uh, we are. This is where the miniaturization comes uh, about. Uh, it's really uh, that you can pack small labs now into very, you know. Uh, Very compact, compact places. Compact places. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but still so much more to understand. I think that also it's safe to say that Mars, although it was not the same as the Earth, was very, very close to what the Earth was. Sure. And, you know, common prebiotic uh, uh, chemistry is, is possible on Mars. I'd say mm -hmm. it's more than possible. Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, it worked on Earth. Uh, the same ingredients were on Mars. Uh, same raw material is there. Same raw material, mm -hmm. so you know it cannot be that that different. Right. I don't think I so, think especially for simple life. Yeah, fabulous. Well, thank you so much for I'm sharing going, that. Yeah, uh, and I am going to show you uh, a bittersweet image, yeah. which is this one here. That's opportunity in June of 2018, taking uh, pictures of the incoming the storm. Oh, that ended its its mission. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was a dust storm that, that covered the entire planet yeah. for more or less a couple of months, wasn't it? Or oh, a lot, more, a lot than more than that. Yeah, these are the kind of, this is the kind of storm that Mariner 9, when it was sent to Mars, uh, encountered yeah. when they were, they inserted the spacecraft into orbit, all of a sudden Mars was just covered, completely covered, and that's why they couldn't see anything. And after a month of that, then it started opening, and then they started discovering Olympus months, the mm -hmm. volcanoes, mm -hmm. and the canyons, and the channels. Like the curtain was exactly. lifted. Uh, well, it's, it's funny, you know, it's ironic that wind really extended these missions by, you know, serendipitously cleaning off the solar panels, and wind put an end yeah. to the mission, and the, you know, when, when there was this planetary-wide dust storm. I mean, imagine something like that on Earth, a planetary storm system. Incredible to imagine that. It's, uh, and as I was uh, saying with you know some of my colleagues, there is uh, there is sadness, but there is a lot more pride than sadness in seeing those missions end. We knew this time would come. Yeah. Uh, the thing we couldn't imagine is that it would take 15 years for yeah. that moment <laughs> yeah, to right. come. Right. Uh, but you know we learned so much. Mm -hmm. I think that Mars became a very familiar landscape, mm -hmm. which is something that is now in 
I manage this consciousness, so it's really the first baby step to take us towards becoming right. an interplanetary civilization. Yeah, I thought you had a great uh, line in the story. So if you would like to read more about spirit and opportunity, um, there's a piece that Matt wrote uh, on our website. It is, uh, what's that? The link is on our website. Okay, yes, yeah, and we're, we're putting the link out to everybody. Um, but it's, it's on the homepage of our website, SETI.org, and it's an article that Nat wrote um, in honor of the Spirit and Opportunity Missions and the MER program. And uh, one of the lines you had in there that I thought was particularly good was that, you know, for the duration of those missions, they essentially allowed everybody on Earth who wanted to, to be part of the mission because every day you could wake up and, you know, dial into the network where images and information were coming down and see new things about Mars. So it really enabled everybody on planet Earth to be explorers along with the NASA scientists. I thought that was a, a very poignant uh, message in, in the story, so uh, wonderful. So lots of, of, uh, of hearts and thumbs up uh, for Spirit and Opportunity and for Nat and her role in, in the site selection of those missions, uh, fantastic, and you know that long, long history. That, of course, continues with Curiosity and, and Mars 2020 I cannot take beyond. credit for what happened with Opportunity because I really focused on Spirit and yeah. uh, I moved on as well when Spirit stopped. Sure, sure. But, and that path took me here, so... There we are. <laughs> all right, and speaking of here, um, we had lots of visitors from all over the place, from Gonzales, Louisiana, Oklahoma City, Seattle, Israel, Phoenix, Albany, New York, Manhattan. Canada, uh, Berlin and Germany, Delaware, Transylvania, uh, Wolfgang, Australia, Ireland, Nevada, Scotland, Costa Rica, uh, Strasbourg and France, say hello, uh, San Gabriel and California, uh, Centralia, Washington, I don't even know where Centralia <laughs> is, uh, but it must be in the middle, Italy, from uh, also Christiansand in Norway, we've seen Christiansand before, so greetings Norway, Spain, Denmark, Arkansas, Iceland, Belgium, North Element, England, um, a sailing vessel, White Swan in San Francisco Bay. I think that's our first ship. So <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Maybe they're just, you know, they're seasick, so everybody's down below watching Facebook Live. I don't know. But anyway, big hello to this White Swan in San Francisco Bay. Uh, Nicaragua, Lisbon, Portugal, San Antonio, Texas, Wales in the UK. And, uh, and that's it. So anyway, wonderful to have everybody from the far corners of this planet uh, with us today to talk about the fourth planet, Mars, and the MER mission, Spirit and Opportunity. Nat, thanks so much once again for sharing those stories. Uh, thanks to our globe. Thanks to our team here <laughs> for bringing you Facebook Live. And we'll see you again next week. What we might do next week, uh, I just had the opportunity uh, a week ago, I was attending a conference uh, about the Arecibo Observatory, that great big, huge 305 meter dish in the mountains of uh, Puerto Rico. and. Uh, had the extraordinary opportunity to spend time with the director there and the staff there getting up on top of that telescope inside the, uh, uh, the Gregorian Dome where all the instruments are suspended in air by cables about 450 feet from the bottom of the dish and I got underneath the dish so I've got videos and photos that we'll be putting up on our website. We'll, uh, we'll try to get some of those videos. You cannot do Facebook Live from the uh, place of a, of a radio telescope for obvious reasons, but we'll put together some clips and get those out on Facebook so you can see them, and we'll talk about those next week and some of the science that's done at the Arecibo Observatory. So we'll see you then, and in the meantime, farewell from Mars, farewell from Mountain View, and the SETI Institute, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.